Well, the, the most influential figure in Jewish humor was Shalom Aleichem, who entertained Yiddish readers. And um, you understand that he was writing at a time when the vast uh, majority of Jews spoke Yiddish. Um, it's interesting how uh, you know, our attitude toward this language this is a bit of a sidebar, but uh, uh, you know that at the time Shalom Aleichem was writing, uh, about 10 million Jews in the world, which is only slightly fewer than the number of Jews that there are in the whole world today, uh, knew Yiddish. That was their language. And it's more Jews than have ever spoken the same language at any time in Jewish history. So that was what Yiddish was. It's not the language of grandmothers. It's not some you know, uh, language worth doping. It was the language of the Jews. And no one, I think, had more influence uh, on this language and on its culture than Shalom Aleichem. Um, and he assumed this pen name of Shalom Aleichem as part of the project of making Jews feel welcome and secure. And in the same way that um, you have Shabbos Nachamu, you know, the Sabbath of consolation that follows the morning of Yom Kippur, and the same way that Israel's Independence Day follows Yom HaShoah and Yom HaZikaron, um, sorry, I have got that wrong, but Shalom Aleichem wanted to bring comfort to his people, which many readers felt that he did. And one critic, for example, compared reading the Shalom Aleichem story to waking from a nightmare. Of course, this means that he first creates the nightmare, and then he wakes you from it and makes you feel so good that it's only a dream after all and that you can awaken from it. And... Um, I mean, just again, I would say that, you know, to think a little bit about Shalom Aleichem is, I, I really, more and more, um, I've always read him with pleasure, but more and more it occurs to me what an influence he has had. Our whole way of thinking about the Jews as a comical people, as a people that laughs through tears, laughs through fears, this comes from Shalom Aleichem. Can you imagine? It wasn't there before. It's true. I mean, you know, if you read 19th century uh, Jewish literature, it's, it's not at all funny like that. He really managed to reconfigure these figures up so that we see the Jews of Fiddler on the Roof, and we think, yeah, yeah, that's what Jews were like, that's really what they're like. And you have these comedies like of, uh, uh, like, you know, about the Holocaust and all the rest of it, and they were really, you know, laughing and so on. This is really, this is what it is to be a cultural influence. I really don't know whether there is another literary figure, never mind only among the Jews, who's had such a profound influence on interpreting a people to itself. So um, it's a, this is just really something which um, sometimes, you know, accumulatively over the years has come to impress me tremendously. Anyway, this is one of his most famous stories, is a story that is variously uh, translated as the enchanted tailor, the bewitched tailor, and the haunted tailor. And it is all based on a folk tale and on a Helm story, which everyone was expected to recognize. So the basic facts of this Helm story are that a teacher's wife wants a nanny goat. And she wants it because the children have nothing to eat. And so she thinks, if, if there's a goat in the house, I'll milk it, and at least they will have that every day. So she persuades her husband with whatever he can get together by selling everything that he has to go to the neighboring uh, town to buy a goat so that she can have milk for the children. On the way back from buying the goat, he stops at an inn where the innkeeper, who is always a sinister figure in folk tales, plays a trick on him and substitutes a billy goat for the nanny. So although he's bought a, a nanny goat, he comes home with a billy goat. Of course, when he brings the animal home, his wife curses him and sends him back to the people who cheated him. But on the way back, the same inn, at the same innkeeper, switches the animals again, so that when he accuses the seller of dishonesty, he simply milks the goat in the presence of witnesses, and he sheepishly has to leave the animal back home, except that the innkeeper plays the same trick on him. And after this happens a second time, the teacher complains to a council of rabbis, how can this be? And since they are helm rabbis, they hand down the following verdict, that whenever a nanny goat comes to hell, it is transformed into a billy goat. 
So to understand, you know Helen's story. So Helen is a Jewish fool's town, um, whose specialty is that the theoretical solution turns out to be practical nonsense. And the story makes fun of the Jews' inability to distinguish the gender of animals, for example, and by implication, their remoteness from nature, their unnatural existence, their false reasoning, and so on. Well, Shalom Aleichem takes this story and adapts it. And um, what he does with it is he gives this character a name and a presence. So this is Shimonelli Shmakalain. And um, he's a poor tailor, and he gets his nickname from the way that he loves to work himself up in the synagogue. He loves to lead the service, putting a trill into his prayers and singing them at the top of his voice. And he also peppers his speech with passages from the Gomorrah, of which he actually knows very little. And so, on the one hand, this allows him to transcend his daily existence. And on the other hand, he might be better paying more attention to what is actually happening around him. So in this story, the same process. He stops off for a drink, and he can't help boasting to the innkeeper, who is a distant relative, about his own you know, knowledge of the Gomorrah and everything. And the innkeeper thinks, I'll pull you down a few notches. Don't you worry. And each time he goes back and forth from his hometown to this goat town, um, an animal changing sex each time. He gets increasing abuse from his wife back home and from the residents of Kozadoyevke, this town where they sell the goats, um, whom he charges with dishonesty. And, um, the, you know, nobody recognizes what the, every reader of the story would recognize, that is to say, the practical joker or the evildoer who is in the middle making the switch. Now, in Shalom Aleichem's story, it's interesting, it goes to a third degree. He goes a third time. And the townspeople get so irate that they take up the feud. And Shimon Eli, at the end, becomes convinced that he is possessed. And he falls into a stupor from which no one can wake him. And only the goat runs free, eluding the efforts of the townspeople to catch it. Our goat had discovered the meaning of freedom and took off wherever its feet would carry him. That's the end of the Shalom Aleichem story. But this is how Shalom Aleichem ends this story. What is the moral of this tale, the reader will ask? Don't press me, friends. It was not a good ending. The tale began cheerfully enough, and it ended, as most such happy stories do, badly. And since you know the author of the story, that he is not naturally a gloomy fellow, and hates to complain and prefers cheerful stories, then let the maker of the tale take his leave of you smiling, and let him wish you Jews and all mankind more laughter than tears. Laughter is good for you. Doctors prescribe laughter. <laughs> now, these last two sentences are very often repeated. Doctors prescribe laughter. But as so often happens, they are taken out of context, missing the irony of this story. Shalom um, had originally called this story a story without an end, suggesting the timeless, the repetitive nature of the way the Jew fails to learn from his experience. The humorist in the story, the author, steps in at the end to confess that this time he was unable to do what he always does, is to rescue the laughter from the tears. And this was the skill which made him famous. It's the skill on which Jewish humor relies. A lot of comedy, um, it, a comedy draws from what the philosopher Henri Bergson calls something mechanical encrusted on the living. People failing to adapt to their situation. Bergson says that's, the, that's what humor really is. You see, if I walked down here and I tripped on this, he says you would laugh. You would laugh. If somebody trips on the sidewalk, you're like, why? We're not sadistic. But he says it's because one expects the human animal to adapt to situations. And when the human animal functions mechanically and doesn't adapt, that becomes humor. Well, this story really fits into that pattern. Um, it really deals with that same kind of obtuseness. And it's entirely possible that Shalom Aleichem had intended to write another comic story. 
But maybe like Shimanelli, he tried it once too often, and this time he could not pull it off. It's a very interesting insight that he offers us in this story. Laughter may be good for you, but a surfeit leads to madness. Here, comedy leads to death and catastrophe. The innocent man does not recognize the presence of evil. The man eager to lead the synagogue prayer can't even navigate the real world. So um, here, it, it intensifies of the problems that Jews look for a resolution in comedy. It shows you what comedy can do. And this, this story seems to me a humorist's confession that it is possible to overdose. It is possible to, uh, to take this uh, too far. 